So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tim Mackey. Dr. Mackey is an associate professor of anesthesiology and global public health at UC San Diego School of Medicine. He is also the director of healthcare research and policy at UC San Diego Extension. He is also the director of the Global Health Policy Institute, an organization directed to the interdisciplinary study of important national, regional, and global public health issues. Dr. Mackey's work focuses on a broad array of multidisciplinary topics in domestic and global public health, including cross-cutting research in the disciplines of public health, health technology and innovations, supply chain, pharmaceutical policy, international relations, and public policy and law. He has co-authored nearly 150 publications and given numerous presentations to audiences in academia, industry, and government. He has, an extensive professional, he has extensive professional experience working for more than 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry, as well as acting as a consultant for the World Health Organization, the U.S. Department of State, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Finally, he holds a leadership position as a co-chair for the standards group within the IEEE, a technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. In this role, Dr. Mackey focuses on stakeholder collaboration around blockchain technology for the pharmaceutical supply chain. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mackey to the stage. Thank you. All right, so All right uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great, okay. Oh, yeah, let's take a look. There you so, go. So there's what curious, you're dealing with. <laughs> confused, interest, intrigued. Oh, a lot of unfamiliarity when it comes to blockchain, I think. And um, Jennifer first asked the question of how many of you know the term blockchain. How many of you know the term Bitcoin? All right, now we're getting some responses. So um, let me grab my, uh, my clicker so I don't forget it. Sorry. Oh, this is, here we go. Okay, great. So I'm not sure which question this is. Maybe this was the one that we just went through, but okay, here's a really fun question to start the, the talk with. Which of the following is not a form of cryptocurrency? And if you don't know what cryptocurrency is, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, it's a digital currency. So go ahead and uh, try to answer that real quickly as we go through this. The first one is Ether, Bitcoin, Dash, SpongeBob, SquareCoin, and Dogecoin. All right, I think we can get started. You guys pretty much all figured out which one was not the actual cryptocurrency, which is the SpongeBob SquareCoin. But for those of you who did not get that, do not feel bad. I'm sure there will be a Sponge, uh, uh, SpongeBob SquareCoin in the near future that Nickelodeon will create. Um, so essentially, a lot of the noise that you're hearing right now about, big, about blockchain is about all these different cryptocurrencies and tokens that are being issued by uh, blockchain uh, companies. And so that's where a lot of the discussion in the media has been about the cost of Bitcoin, about the appreciation of it. But behind Bitcoin is a technology called blockchain. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to be talking about it from the context of what we call business blockchain. Okay? Second question, do you need a cryptocurrency to operate a blockchain? So the question is, do you need something like a Bitcoin to actually have a blockchain? Let's take a look at that real quick. Give you a little bit of time to respond to that. And we use these EV polls, uh, everywhere polls, all the time in academia because students have many distractions these days, so we have to keep them interested. So this is a good integration of, uh, of getting some audience interaction. So again, you guys are spot on. You do not need a cryptocurrency to operate a blockchain, and that's one of the first things we want to dispel in the issue of understanding what blockchain is. Blockchain is not a cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is actually something you can just add on a blockchain to incentivize participation of your, of your nodes or your different actors in, in the blockchain. So we have about an hour, which I know is long for anyone. So I'm gonna give you guys a first a quick agenda of where we're going. We'll leave some about 15 minutes at the end to kind of have a good discussion, and that's where a lot of the most robust discussion happens is in the Q&A. But first, we're going to talk about a case study in supply chain security. Many of you may be aware of it. I'm going to provide some, you guys with some of that as a context for why blockchain is being explored for pharmaceutical supply chain applications. We'll talk about what a blockchain for pharmaceutical supply chain might look like. And then we'll also talk about other uses in healthcare, which are good from a comparative standpoint to figure out what other industries in the healthcare space are using blockchain for. And it's important in the context of what does design of blockchain look like? And what, how can we make sure it's fit for purpose for a particular healthcare challenge? 
and then we'll have some final thoughts and looming questions, and again, hopefully have a great discussion about this. So a uh, real quick disclosure statement, I am on an advisory board of a blockchain company, and I also, as previously mentioned, am working a lot with the group IEEE. Has everyone heard of IEEE before? Any engineers in the room? EE people? So one of the largest professional associations in the world, uh, really focused on technology adoption and innovation, and they have an industry connections working group focused on blockchain and the healthcare space. So first, we're gonna talk about a case study in pharmaceutical supply chain security. And uh, you probably can, it's written here, but I'm just gonna ask the audience real quick, informally, what do you think each of these blue points represents? Anyone have an idea of what these blue points represent on the map? And you can yell it out, there's no mics. I'm sorry? Yeah, well, it's written at the top, so that helps. <laughs> but essentially what each of these blue points are, are a clinical practice that received a notice from the FDA saying that they may have purchased a counterfeit version of the anti-cancer drug Avastin, uh, produced by Genentech Roche. Um, so we plotted this uh, data because, of course, it's not available from the FDA. It's actually in PDF format. You've got to pull all the addresses out and then map and code them back to a geospatial map. And essentially, each of these doctors received a notice that said, you may have purchased from these unauthorized distributors, and the Avastin was in, was in fact cornstarch and acetone. So it had no active pharmaceutical ingredient in it at all. And um, the reason why we found this is because it's an example of bad counterfeiting. So if you're a good counterfeiter, you at least make the packaging look good, because you just can print it. In this case, actually, the packaging had foreign uh, language markings on the back and a nurse picked it up, and that's how it was discovered that uh, patients in the US uh, were being administered cornstarch instead of Avastin, and the cost was about 500 bucks cheaper than the actual Avastin reference price. That's still $2,000 cornstarch, if you can think of it that way. Um, so what the uh, counterfeit Avastin case study told us was that even though we're in one of the tightest uh, controlled drug supply chains in the world, the, arguably the most robust and secure drug supply chain, we still have vulnerabilities, and partially that's because we don't currently have fully implemented a national track and trace system for pharmaceutical products. Uh, this particular incident originated what we think from Turkey, and it entered the drug supply chain through multiple jurisdictions, finally got into a US wholesaler, who is an unauthorized wholesaler through the gray market, and was purchased then by clinics through a fax blast. So essentially, they were getting fax blasts saying you can buy Avastin for much cheaper than from your authorized distributor. All right? um, in total, there were 949 FDA safety notices and 795 different zip codes uh, in almost all states, 48 different states and two US territories. And to this day, we do not know how many patients were actually impacted. So you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But this is just the FDA notifying physicians who may have prescribed uh, fake Avastin. This has nothing to do with the consumer level. All right, so prosecution-wise, uh, we had about 13 prosecutions. Uh, this is Paul Bottomley, he was on CBS. Um, he lost his Aston Martin, unfortunately, for him. Uh, but most of these people uh, received no more than probation and uh, forfeiture of, of course, assets. So some of these guys lost millions of dollars, but very few of them actually served any jail time for their involvement. Uh, in this incident. And this is just a microcosm for much, a much larger problem that I've actually been focusing a lot of my research on for the last about 10 years, and that is really looking at the global trade in fake medicines that is occurring all over the world. And so counterfeits, which we don't call counterfeits in the public health space, we actually call them falsified, substandard, spurious, uh, <laughs> fraudulent medicines because counterfeit in terms has a term associated with IP. But essentially it occurs all across the drug supply chain. All types of healthcare settings been detected in hospitals, pharmacies, community markets, wholesale markets, the informal economy. If you go to some least developing countries, you'll find a lot of counterfeits in night markets and bodegas and a lot of informal settings. Um, we really don't know the global statistics around this. We don't know what the prevalence of counterfeits are in the drug supply chain because it is very hard to measure criminal activity. Criminals are not forthcoming in annual reports or uh, providing surveillance reports about how much medicines they're trading in. 
And two, it's a form of pharmaceutical crime. So this falls into the context of diversion and other forms of pharmaceutical crime, fraud and abuse, that occur within health systems. Um, and these are some of the manufacturing plants that are not up to CGMP that uh, produce these fake medicines. And in fact, we have a fake medicines problem right now in this country, correct? Does anyone know what that is? No? The fentanyl problem. So fentanyl, and a lot of the deaths associated with fentanyl, including Prince, with the toxology report just coming out about a week ago, he ingested actually a, a painkiller. I believe it was Vicodin he was presuming he was, he was ingesting, but it was laced with fentanyl. So a lot of the fentanyl deaths are associated with fake opioids being laced with fentanyl because dealers are, uh, it's cheaper to cut fentanyl than it is to actually put API in it. So again, we have a problem right now when it comes to fake medicines in our opioid crisis, and it's a really important problem. Um, so we uh, have done some analysis of actual pharmaceutical security data uh, that is not public, and it shows, again, that we have a lot of incidents between 2009 and 2011 in the closed drug supply chain, which is not these areas that you would um, expect diversion, uh, not uh, night markets, et cetera, that there are 1,500 incidents between 2009 and 2011. And the fact is that that's probably a lot of underreporting because many countries that we know there are incidents of fake medicines are not reporting into this system. Okay? So this is the FDA supply chain diagram. You might not agree with it. It looks oversimplified, and you guys are all supply chain people here. But I want to talk to you about what, you know, kind of the vulnerabilities of counterfeit, mar counterfeit markets really show us about uh, potential issues that we can improve in the drug supply chain. So generally, you have API manufactured by, um, you know, raw material manufacturers, a lot of them overseas. Uh, it is then sent to a manufacturer or a contract manufacturer, which actually finishes the final product. And then when you get into the wholesale market or the secondary market, that's where a lot of times this diversion and counterfeiting can infiltrate the drug supply chain. And in this case, you know, you really need authentication, verification, and track and trace throughout these multiple partners occurring in this middle section. And that's exactly what happened with Avastin. Avastin came in through the gray market, through this unregulated wholesale market. And then, of course, at the hospital and healthcare setting, a lot of times there is no data exchange between these different disparate actors. And finally, the patient themselves, anyone probably here, when you receive a medicine or dispense a medicine, you probably don't have any idea if it's authentic or not or any way to check it. So the consumer has a lot of information asymmetry when it comes to whether that medicine is actually the real thing. And they have very little opportunity to check that. Um, and then we have the internet which is another area that I do a lot of uh, research in, which is internet pharmacies that sell completely outside of these channels, which even confuse this issue even more. All right, so getting to that, and kind of the teaser there is, is if you have all these different disparate actors who are not sharing data, what is a central solution uh, that could actually work for this? I guess you guys can probably guess what I'm, where I'm going with that. Okay, so part two we're gonna talk about is the pharma chain. What would the pharma chain look like? And because we're here and talking about blockchain, we really have to first get a gauge of how many people are familiar with what actually blockchain is. So please rate your knowledge about blockchain technology based on a scale of one to five. One, of course, being very little, and five being very familiar. All right, so we can go ahead and get started, and we'll do this periodically. I think there's about four or five questions throughout uh, the presentation. Um, do not feel bad if you don't know anything about blockchain. Up until about two and a half years ago, I didn't know what blockchain was. I actually got a call from a friend of mine who I work with um, on counterfeit medicines issues, and he said, do you know anything about blockchain? And I said, no, I don't even know what that is. And we were trying to prepare a white paper for the ONC, which is the White House Technology Office, and submit it on this use case. And it's taken me about two years to fully conceptualize what blockchain is. And it's been a wonderful academic pursuit. It's like a puzzle that you can kind of learn. So you probably will get a lot of this in one day, but don't feel bad if you don't fully understand it at the end of the presentation, because it is relatively complex. Um, let's see. So what blockchain is not is it's not Bitcoin. That's the most important thing to learn from this presentation. Do not conflate those two issues. Blockchain is the architecture by which Bitcoin operates. It's what makes Bitcoin possible. Um, and again, 
Bitcoin is, be I mean, sorry, now I'm confusing the two. Blockchain is used in a lot of different industries. So we in healthcare are really starting to emerge as one of the core industries that are looking at blockchain from a solutions perspective. But financial technology, the banking sector, has been looking at blockchain for a long period of time and is much more advanced than healthcare is. And then, of course, digital identity is this really amazing concept that you can have all of your identity in a blockchain. So essentially now, your digital identity is fragmented across multiple logins, except for Facebook. I think they have everything of yours. So, um, but all these different digital identities that populate across all of these different uh, digital platforms. And the idea is that blockchain could form a single block, and that would be your identity, from maybe your birth certificate all the way to your death certificate, potentially. Um, so uh, asset management is another area, and also supply chain, not just with uh, pharmaceutical products, but in other commodities as well. So there's a lot of discussion about use cases. There's a lot of hype. There's probably a lot of management consulting firms that you could talk to that are telling you about different solutions in blockchain. I am not a blockchain seller. I'm not a blockchain you know, uh, evangelist. I'm actually more of a blockchain apologist because I believe blockchain can fit in certain purposes, but it doesn't have to fit for everything. There's also other technology that we can look at as well. Uh, what, some of the key concepts of what blockchain is, is it's a distributed ledger, which means instead of holding one ledger or your own ledger, it's a distributed ledger across multiple parties, and they all own the same ledger. So that means if everyone has the same ledger, then you can verify that the information is correct because you can verify all those ledgers have the same information. And then there's no single point of failure. And that's essentially a distributed network of computers. You have a hash change, or, which basically tells you that one transaction is related to another. So a hash says, this hash came from a previous transaction, and it links those two blocks together. Okay? And then you have consensus, where you have a consensus algorithm or mechanism that basically is a rule set that tells you, yes, we agree that this information is verified. Okay, so those are the three main principles. This is a graph of uh, Hyperledger, which is Linux Foundation, which is trying to build some of kind of open source platforms for blockchain. And they asked the question of what is the most likely application in healthcare. And the biggest area was EHRs. So that's where a lot of the discussion is right now in the healthcare space. But supply chain is very much coming up, even though it's not on this graph. Okay, the other thing, do not be shy. If you want to learn more about blockchain, there's this great book by IBM called Blockchain for Dummies. It's really good, actually. I read it all the time. I even refresh myself a lot. And then there's a uh, review article, if you like the peer review, for those of you who like boring journal articles, called Blockchain Distributed Ledger Technologies for Biomedical and Healthcare Applications. A colleague of mine at UCSD wrote it uh, in the Bioinformatics Division. So generally speaking, again, some of the basics are we have these key characteristics for a blockchain. And when, again, when, we, when I'm talking about blockchain, I'm talking about a business blockchain, not the blockchains that are used for cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin. So first, you have to have consensus, meaning that for a, traction, a transaction to be valid, all participants must agree to its validity. Second, you have to have provenance, which shows that an asset came from one place and how its ownership changed over time. So that's provenance of data. Third, you have to have immutability, which means that no participant can uh, alter that record uh, in a way that the other participants can't see. So the idea is, is if someone uh, ent enters an invalid entry, everyone in the distributed network sees it, and people can say that's not a valid transaction. Okay? And then finality. So that, that ledger, the shared ledger, represents the final ledger. So there's not different versions or anything like that, but everyone has the same final version. Okay? And the other thing that we have is, so we have the shared ledger technology, which is at the core of a blockchain. You have permission structures, which allow people access to certain parts of information, because as a lot of you here know, supply chain information is very confidential. Um, so you have permission level structures that allow certain users to have certain access. And then you have things like consensus, which, which we talked about in just uh, before. And then you have an application layer, what's called a distributed application layer, that operates on top of the blockchain that allows you to actually have transactions and business processes. And one of those things is a smart contract. Has anyone heard of a smart contract before here? It's actually just code for a contract. It's electronic code, and it can self-execute based on terms that you preset. And instead of having a paper contract, you essentially have code that is a contract, OK? Um, and then, of course, the other thing about blockchain is 
is that when you have a centralized network, that means you have the opportunity for attack or failure because you have a single point of vulnerability. In a decentralized network, which is not a blockchain, um, you have no single point of failure, but you have this problem of gaining consensus because you have data in different distributed computers. And the advantage of blockchain when it combines these two is that you have no single point of failure and you have consensus, okay? We're a few minutes in and you guys survived that. Are you okay? All right, so this is a good graph I'm just gonna show you for reference purposes. I'm not really gonna talk about it too much, but there are questions about whether you actually need a blockchain. This was done by uh, Gideon Greenspan. It's all on LinkedIn, so you can find this one. This is not scientifically peer reviewed or anything, but there are other technologies such as cloud computing, um, just regular distributed ledger technology, not blockchain. Um, and those technologies are also viable for a lot of the applications we're thinking about today. So you don't necessarily need a blockchain, but this is kind of the decision matrix you could go to to figure out if that's something you want to explore. All right, so now we're gonna shift from the blockchain basics into why blockchain is important for healthcare and really get into this use case of uh, pharmaceutical supply chain. So there's certain design principles you, you have to think about when, when even kind of exploring whether blockchain would be right for you. And so what we argue, and what my role in IEEE is, is making sure a blockchain is fit for purpose for a particular healthcare challenge. Because a lot of time technologists will say, blockchain is the answer for everything. But they don't think about the actual use case in healthcare and whether, you know, essentially it, it will fit for purpose. So at its core, a blockchain is an immutable distributed ledger. So this is kind of like if you're going to have a quiz or a midterm, remember this one right here, and then you'll be good. Uh, that can better ensure the resilience, provenance, traceability, and management of healthcare data. So that's the core application of blockchain in healthcare. Some decision design uh, things that you have to really think about are we have three primary design elements. One is, is it a private model? Which means it's a closed blockchain, not open to the public and not open to any user. Um, and that's what most business blockchains are, they're private blockchains. Is it a public blockchain? So a public blockchain is like Bitcoin. Any of you here can buy Bitcoin. That means that's a, it's a public uh, blockchain. And, and there's some computing issues associated with you know, having a public uh, blockchain ledger. Anyone here an investor in Bitcoin? No. We're in Nashville, by the way, which is, oh, we got one over there. That's great. Um, which is a hotbed for blockchain discussion in healthcare. Really fascinating. I've been out here once before, and I have a colleague here at Lipscomb University that does a lot of blockchain stuff. Um, so my, he actually, his, his colleague invested 5,000 in blockchain and came out 95 up. So it's not a bad place to invest, although I would say the last few months have been pretty volatile. Um, and then there's hybrid design elements which build in both of these components, a public and a private component of the blockchain. And really when you think about these design elements, it should map to the healthcare industry specific challenges and characteristics, which I'll talk about in just a sec. And then a lot of times when I talk to people about blockchain or people talk to me about blockchain, especially management consulting firms, it can't just be about the blockchain. It has to be about this added value and process improvement. So a lot of things we talk about blockchain is what it can add from a value add standpoint, and that's added compliance, an audit log, enabling aggregation and data sharing, which means that you can aggregate a lot of data from all these multiple partners, and you can do analysis on it that's partially de-identified, and then incentivizing participation of those actors through tokenization and through cryptocurrencies. Some of the characteristics we look at is what data do you actually want to share on the blockchain, uh, what, uh, whether you want to store data directly on the blockchain, which is called off-chain and on-chain storage, and then the use of other smart contracts like we talked about before. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through each, I'm gonna go into this counterfeit use case, and then in the next section, we're gonna talk about use cases in other healthcare sectors, so you kind of get a good feel of what's going on in the industry. So we do have this problem with fake medicines, and this is how I was brought into blockchain, because they wanted to kind of apply this technology to this problem. And what a blockchain can do is it can ensure better security and uh, immutability of supply chain information. And because of that, you would be able to detect fake medicines better, okay? And so again, it could possibly prevent things like what happened with Avastin. And uh, when you think of the design elements we just got, went through, 
a blockchain for pharmaceutical supply chain, as it's maturing right now, has to be a private blockchain. So remember we talked about public, private, and hybrid? Well, because a lot of supply chain data is very company confidential, you really would have to limit a blockchain to a private uh, network, okay? And then some of the added value beyond this, you know, fake medicines and supply chain integrity are these issues associated with the metadata that you populate in a blockchain can help you with things like uh, recall management, uh, risk of adverse event reporting, these other things that are really process driven and can actually lower cost. And that's actually where I like to be better. Um, this fake medicines use case is not a great use case, but it's a one that people talk about a lot because it catches people's attention. But actually, a really, really good use cases are, are more in the process driven area. So again, what you're envisioning is each of these supply chain actors feeds data into a blockchain. So they each add a block of data, and at the end, you see a pretty chain of blocks, and it tells you the whole history of that medicine. So that's the general con conceptualization of what a blockchain can do in pharmaceutical supply chain. All right? And so there are some models, which we just went through, private, public, consortium. So this is an example of a model where you could have a manufacturer feed in uh, one block of data to their primary wholesaler. That transaction is executed by a smart contract. It's not executed by a paper contract. Uh, and then when they sell to the secondary wholesale market, those smart contracts verify compliance based on identity of those individuals, those different trading nodes. And then if a trading node is sent to an unauthorized secondary wholesaler, that block of data is rejected. And then, of course, you can have uh, a blockchain that really only focuses on your specific supply chain network. So this is not an open blockchain at all. It's just you as a manufacturer and your supply chain network and maybe the actual dispenser. So a very limited uh, blockchain with a, a fewer number of nodes. So this is the one that scares people the most, I think. This is a consortium-based model, and I presented on this at the FDA in January, and they like this model because this includes the FDA looking at all of this data. <laughs> so a consortium-based model means that you have a similar process, but certain snippets or certain information of the blockchain on a permissions-based level can be accessible by the FDA. So essentially what this would allow is the FDA an, a very proactive audit log into kind of all the blockchain data that's being fed in, okay? And I think most people in this room probably are not too excited about this one. But uh, this is being discussed about uh, how the FDA can act as a, maybe a central administrator for a blockchain model. I'm I can tell you that most of the discussion in industry is not moving in this direction. Um, but essentially, the contract compliance could be based on regulatory controls, including, we'll talk a little bit about the DSCSA later on, um, but things like uh, establishment license, making sure that a, a trading partner is uh, registered with the Board of Pharmacy, et cetera. So these things can be built into smart contract compliance. Uh, so again, this is a consortium-based model. And uh, then we have things that are like public models, public hybrid models, where you have a blockchain that actually extends to the end dispenser and the actual user. And these allow the patient potentially to self-verify medicines, which we do in other countries, through M pedigree and E pedigree type of uh, technology. Um, so this is much, much far in the future and probably won't happen anytime soon because it implicates a lot of uh, other challenges such as PHI, HIPAA, et cetera. But these are other models that people are looking for from a more consumer health perspective. So does that give you a flavor of public, private versus hybrid? Okay, good. All right, so some of the other things that are benefits of a pharmaceutical blockchain is that it can integrate other forms of technology because a blockchain just verifies the information that you're putting into it, that it came from the person that it should have came from. But if the data is garbage, it won't matter because it will just verify that someone uploaded garbage data. So there's other technologies, authentication, serialization, we'll go through some of those, that you can feed into a blockchain and it will provide more resolution to the integrity of the supply chain. A security we already talked about, a lot of the discussion in blockchain is about promoting blockchain so it promotes other data standards for interoperability. So really uh, you know, layering on GS1 and other standards so that blockchain becomes an inter interoperability platform. Um, that's to remain to be seen, but that's again another vision of what blockchain can do. Uh, another thing that's been talked about a lot is that a blockchain, because it's technology agnostic, could potentially do something like uh, engage in regulatory harmonization, 
where you could have different uh, jurisdictions operating on the same data standards. And then finally, the policy rationale for this, because whenever you have new technology, it's exciting. Uh, everyone gets a, you know, uh, wants to implement it to a certain extent or pilot it. But if you don't have a policy framework to support it, then it won't go anywhere. And this is an interesting component, which Marianne, I believe, will be talking about later on, which is DSCA, DSCSA really maps well to blockchain when it comes to what's required and what technology could bring together uh, DSCSA compliance. Uh, we'll be talking about a little bit about the integrative component, integration component right now, because I think it's important. So getting back to this use case of fake medicines. So there's different technologies out there that can enable better detection and classification of fake medicines. So there's, of course, serialization, which all of you are experts here on, and uh, I don't have to belabor. There's authentication, there's track and trace, and all of these uh, particular anti-counterfeiting solutions help you know, verify that the medicine is authentic and that it's going to where it should be. And a lot of the ways that we test for the actual product is through chemical analysis. So anyone here in analytical chemistry? Probably not, okay. Liquid chromatography, mass spec, some of these terms you may have heard of, they're ways that we laboratory test medicines for their actual you know, authentication to make sure they are the medicines that they are. And this is a huge problem because uh, we have an antimicrobial resistance issue and many uh, antimicrobials are faked in the least developing countries. So that includes antimalarials, where some countries there's up to 50% of antimalarials have less than 100% active pharmaceutical ingredient, which means it's leading to resistance of these pathogens. Um, so essentially, we have to quantify whether the medicine has API in it, maybe a binary question, yes or no, and then what percentage it has. Um, and then we have these digital solutions that are really the innovative components of where we're going in pharmaceutical supply chain security. Um, so we did a study looking at all of the different technologies that are out there. It's published. I can share it with you if you're interested. We looked at all the literature from uh, the health literature, uh, IEEE, which is engineering literature, and the computer science literature, and we found some interesting stuff. So first, we grouped it into two areas, one that deals with online pharmacies and the other one that deals with drug supply chain issues. And there's some interesting things in mobile technology. Has anyone seen this before, M pedigree? Okay, so this is something that's used in a lot of uh, low to middle income countries, where essentially you scratch off a barcode, you enter the information in it, and then that user can verify whether that, that drug came from the manufacturer itself, okay? So there's some protection because you have to scratch off the barcode first, and then it essentially, you text that information to a central database, cloud database, and then it tells you whether that medicine came from the manufacturer, okay? Um, there's RFID technology, which I'm sure many of you have heard of here, radio frequency identifiers, which basically actively transmit information about where that medicine is located. Much more proactive than barcode or serialization or other forms of uh, barcoding like QR cards, holograms, things like that. And then there's blockchain technology, and then there's some stuff for online pharmacies, which I won't get into. Um, so this is an example again. You scratch it off, you text the information, and it goes and it confirms whether the medicine's fake or not. This is a very interesting application of a, of a mix of technology. This is actually thin layer chromatography using a mobile phone. So they 3D printed the cradle here, and then they use a mobile phone to scan the medicine and determine how much API is in it. Okay? It's pretty interesting there. And this is an example of uh, low tech and high tech. So this is a PDA, which is a paper analytical device, sorry, a pad. And what essentially it does is you uh, put some active ingredient on here, and then the, uh, the paper analytic device tells you by color coding whether that medicine is fake or not. The problem is it's really hard to read, and especially if you're in a country with low technology adoption, it may be hard to interpret whether the test is fake or not. So they use machine learning to do pattern recognition to figure out whether the uh, analytical device is actually saying it's fake or not. So that's an example, again, of a mix of uh, new and old technology. So, la get to the next question, because you guys are probably gonna, you know, going through 12 minutes or so. Uh, based on your best knowledge, how do you characterize your company's adoption of blockchain? And since a lot of you were unsure of what blockchain was, I'm guessing we're gonna get information that's in the top half of this, which is no current plans, evaluating pilot applications, currently piloting its use, actively at using, and I'm not sure. All right, great. So I'm guessing some of the responses in C might even be coming from Cardinal itself. 
So uh, I'm aware that uh, Cardinal is looking at blockchain in a, a few different applications, so you'll have that discussion in the roundtables later. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to join that as well and hear more about what Cardinal's doing in the space. But again, there are a lot of companies that are evaluating blockchain. Um, and a lot of them are more multinational pharmaceutical companies, larger pharmaceutical companies, don't have anything in production, but are evaluating it from a pilot standpoint. Okay? So now we're going to go into this next part real quickly that really talks about use cases in other healthcare settings. So we kind of talked about how blockchain can be uh, applied in pharmaceutical supply chain, but what are other healthcare industries doing? And it's really informative because they're doing very different things when it comes to blockchain. So again, we talked about recall management, and this is something that Walmart is actually uh, piloting with IBM for their food supply chain. So they have a very good use case, something actually in production, where Walmart's looking at all of their food supply chain um, distributors and manufacturers and trying to measure performance and things like that. And one of the things that they're looking at is spoilage, returns of products, and also recall. So they have a recall-based blockchain that, again, can help uh, aid in lowering the cost of uh, recalls. When I was in industry, we went through one recall, and we paid Stericycle a lot of money to get to our percentage cap that the FDA wanted to show that we recalled those devices. What we did was we had Stericycle reach out to every single distributor we had, and they had to basically mine those customer lists to figure out who were, was actually getting our product. So a lot of times, a manufacturer has no idea which consumers are actually getting their product. So what a blockchain can do is enable a audit log that can then track and trace that information back to the end user if you extend it to a public blockchain. Um, and again, that could enable better compliance to FDA requirements, but also enable better strategic recall of products that are specific to a particular recall notice. Um, and again, these are things that really add value to a process chain and can lower cost as well. Um, in the space of clinical trials, blockchain is very, very mature. And one of the things about clinical trials that is very important is that we have to recruit patients. So smart contracts can actually enable better matching of uh, clinical trial participants and also e-consent them easier than the ways that we do it now, which are mostly paper-based. The other thing is, is that in order to validate the claims that we make in a clinical trial, we have to ensure that information is correct because it's really going to go to the peer review and it's gonna validate scientific claims associated with the efficacy of a particular product or medicine or intervention. So having verification is very important. So blockchain is being used to really think about how we can verify clinical data to a study protocol. Uh, and the design elements here are that it's usually a hybrid design where we're looking at patient recruitment is a public blockchain because we want anyone able to participate. And then the clinical trial protocol, when we're actually administering the clinical trial, is a private blockchain. So does that make sense? Hybrid, public versus private. Uh, and then the additional benefit is that it could create shared patient databases that then can be mined for future clinical uh, uh, trial participation. So if you build these patient databases, instead of putting a notice or a, something on NPR about you're recruiting patients for an obesity trial, you'll have that data set available to you right now. Uh, medical devices in another space that is actually using blockchain in different ways. And what they're looking at is really this interface between uh, I IoT, which is an Internet of Things, where most devices are now connected, and seeing if blockchain can kind of fit in that paradigm, security being a main issue. So one of the things that a blockchain can do is enable things that go beyond IoT, such as uh, having a smart contract that automates a maintenance process. So whenever a product needs to be um, updated or upgraded or maintained, um, then that can actually be enabled by a smart contract. And also, the other thing that's being looked at is making sure that there's tamper-proof logs of medical device logs if a uh, patient uh, failure occurs, and then also a better way to validate insurance claims because a lot of the medical device space and the health informatics space is moving towards patient compliance for reimbursement more than just dispensing devices and hoping they, that people stay compliant on them. Um, and recall is another area that could help here in this area as well. Some of the consumer-focused devices are really focused on tokenization, which means they're just trying to incentivize patients to share their data with that device. So if a device acts as a hub and generates more information from the patient, then that company can, of course, license and uh, make money off of that data. So there's some examples out there with a blockchain-enabled medical devices that are really, again, 
focused on getting data from the consumer. Uh, the genomic space, which you'll hear a little about more in the precision medicine panel, is another big space in blockchain. And what this area is really focusing on is uh, this explosion in uh, information associated with our genome and with our genetic risk uh, to particular diseases. How many of you in here have taken a genetic screening test? 23andMe, maybe Ancestry.com, that's not a health screening test, but there's all these direct consumer uh, genetic tests. And what you're actually doing as an active participant is you're generating your own health consumer information data. And guess what? A lot of companies want that sequencing data. So these companies are really focusing on, can you share your, um, you know, your sequencing with us or your genetic profile with us so that we can mine it and use it for other purposes such as looking for you know, cures for rare diseases, things like that. So many of these companies are using blockchain to verify that your genetic data is from you know, the person who uploaded it, things like that. So that's really their focus, but it can, blockchain can be used to bring in all these different disparate data points. So your genetic data is only one predisposition to your uh, health risk. Your environmental factors, your health behavior, all these other population health issues may relate to your risk to a particular disease. And in order to understand why people have risk, we have to understand all those data parameters. Okay? And then, <laughs> this is a little a bit of a boring one, so I won't go through it too much, but if you're in the academic publishing business, you know that there's a lot of room for disruption. So we publish peer review reports, and it takes forever. So uh, most journals will take six to eight months to publish a peer review article. And when you think about the most innovative science and the most innovative things that we're doing in academia, a lot of it being funded by the taxpayer, that's probably too long and too inefficient to really get that innovation out there and, and get it translated. So there's a lot of, this is actually a data framework and data governance component I came up with that we've pitched a few times uh, that envisions changing the academic publishing cycle through a blockchain management process and also incentivizing participants, participants in that network. So we're doing pretty good on time. Um, I'm just gonna finish up with these last few uh, slides about translation, which is we talked a lot about blockchain. There's a lot of companies in the blockchain space. There's a lot of management consulting firms talking about how great blockchain can work for a pharmaceutical supply chain, but what's really happening when it comes to translation? So one, I won't get too much into DSCSA, you're gonna get a full talk about that from Marianne next. But DSCSA, we're five years in, and it really, you know, essentially is going to require a national track and trace system. And a lot of the things that we talked about when we talk about fake medicines, counterfeits, et cetera, are also requirements for notification in the DSCSA. And there is an issue of the FDA also looking for data standards in what an electronic national track and trace system would look like. Um, so, what would be a good technology to implement this? Maybe blockchain or maybe just barcodes. You know, we'll see. Um, so a lot of the elements of, of DSCSA map well with blockchain. Product identification, product tracing, product verification, detection and response notification, information requirements, et cetera. And so what's going on now is that we have this group of organizations like myself who are in academia, which we're conceptualizing how a blockchain could look for pharmaceutical supply chain. We have a lot of companies trying to commercialize it and really get adoption of the technology in the commercial sector. And then we have a policy framework with the FDA, DSCSA, but also in Europe that relates to fake medicines and other types of uh, supply chain issues, which can absorb this technology and maybe implement it. So translation to implementation. These are just a, a, a short list of some of the companies operating in the pharmaceutical supply chain space with blockchain, there's many. And some additional topics of interest that we'll clo kind of close on is these open questions about how secure a blockchain is. A lot of the design um, conceptualization that's going into a blockchain for pharmaceutical supply chain takes this distributed ledger model and actually collapses it back into a central administrator. So if you have a central administrator, a blockchain could still be vulnerable to attacks. Um, should PHI be stored on a blockchain? Anyone want to guess the answer to that? No. Yes, it should not be stored on a blockchain because when you store PHI on a blockchain, it just gets distributed across multiple actors. And then it gets harder to you know, get compliance with your HIPAA BAs, your subcontractor BAs, things like that. Uh, what is the impact of GDPR? Everyone here heard of GDPR before in the EU? Okay, so that's a robust privacy law 
that is in place in the EU gives the, any consumer the right to be forgotten. So that means that if you distribute that information on a blockchain, it's a lot harder to make sure that that information can then be deleted and uh, taken away. What about ICOs and tokens? Again, we talked about you don't need a token or a cryptocurrency to operate a blockchain, but if you want to incentivize participation in the blockchain, sure, it can be a good way to, to, to use uh, tokenization. And again, what is the role for standard setting, which means should a blockchain have certain standards and should we certify and verify that a blockchain meets these requirements? Um, so again, final slide. Patients continue to remain susceptible to poor quality and diverted drugs. There are solutions that are needed. Blockchain represents one of those solutions, one of those potential solutions. There are a lot of challenges, but what it can do is potentially enable interoperability, ensure verification of information, increase transparency, depending on how much data is shared, and can be used by disparate stakeholders. And the next step is really more research, uh, really some good stuff that goes into production that people can learn from, and hopefully uh, we'll have a blockchain and pharmaceutical supply chain that actually works. So uh, opportunities to engage further, if you're interested in this industry connections group we've got going with uh, IEEE, it's open uh, to anyone. And the idea that IEEE, the reason why they do this is more for an antitrust issue. Um, IEEE creates these industry connection groups so people from industry can come together and talk about standards in, in an in environment that doesn't violate antitrust uh, components. Um, and so we're looking at it from the context of clinical trials, pharmaceutical supply chain, and medical device. And then if you're on the West Coast and you're interested in more about what we talked about today and want to hear from people other than myself, people from IBM, Intel, um, Accenture, things like that, then we are, we are having a conference uh, educational uh, workshop at UCSD uh, conducted with IEEE. So if you're interested in that, you can ask me more about that. So finally, just acknowledgments. It's never just one person that generates all this knowledge and all this data. There's a whole bunch of people behind it. Again, IEEE I've been working with for the last two and a half years. And in tech, two and a half years is like two decades. So I've been, I'm, a, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a senior person when it comes to blockchain. Uh, and then, of course, uh, thanks to some of the funders who funded our research on the counterfeit of Aston. So we'll end with that, and then we'll hopefully have some good questions and some good discussion. Thanks.